Hello, Mr. Troy. Good afternoon. How are you doing today, sir? We're good. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, welcome to Talk to Tattoo. It's a pleasure having you here. Pleasure and honor to be on the show. You know, some people are actually wondering why Troy Pelshay, you know, and who is Troy Pelshay. And uh, I know some people are actually wondering what is Talk to Tattoo? You know, um, before we, uh, I give you the floor to tell us about you, you know, um, I just want to say to everybody out there who's watching the show or who probably going to watch the show after that, Talk to Tattoo is a platform in which we want to, uh, uh, the goal is to bring Africans together. The goal is to showcase African diaspora making a difference in every single thing they do and every day, you know, every day of their life. Um, you know, so we can make Africa a better place and Africa a great continent. So that's basically what it's all about. So today we have in Troy Pershak. Troy, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna introduce you, okay? Because you have to do the intro introduction because your bio is so long, man. I was trying to read it. I mean, you know, I I fell asleep reading it, man. It's so long, man. How do you do that? You bought a tattoo. <laughs> How do you do that? I'm surprised, man. Like, tell me, I hear you from Nigeria. Of course. Okay. okay, tell me why 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 are you here? I mean, why not Nigeria? I mean, tell me, man. Uh first of all, I'm a Nigerian born on the plateau today. Uh parents came here in the early eighties actually for education. And after okay. that, different government schemes, so during the process government regime changed and parents just felt like it was for us here in the States and it was really big. Uh, more opportunity here, a lot more promise, and they figured the uh, structure we use it here, so we just came to stay in the states. Um, and it's proven to be very beneficial on both ends, challenging and beneficial at the same time. Okay, okay, okay. So when you came here, and you say, man, okay, let me ask you, what were the what was the challenges that you faced when you came here? Because you know, he's um, coming from a different land, from a different part of the world. You know, obviously Nigeria was not, you know, like the U.S. So, I mean, what are the challenges that you face, you know, when you get here? I think the biggest challenges are being in multiple cultures and ethnicities. One being a black in the United States, and at, at the same point, being able to connect directly with African Americans because they also different from there was you know, different and backgrounds. So therefore, you have the space where you're black, African, African. So you've got a lot of the different acceptance. You know, kids, kids uh, when they get they get older, they you know, they really. You know, you know, know them all day, like people know the food. Very cool times. But of course, when you run into it, that's when you go to the end of the adaptation for a good Friday night. I was so happy to see that they didn't let me just do the school. I feel like they come in to the stage in the late age. And then vice versa. Um, when they back, automatically get their African counterparts because them too is like you can grow up with them. You don't know anything that you do here. You know, they start seeing you know, things like IJ Bull or IJ Capital. So they have they kind of difficulty, difficulty in uh, adapting and adapting. Okay, okay, okay. So let me ask you. I mean, is uh, you know, some people out there probably had the same experience that I did. You know, I had, um, uh, you know, I was uh, I remember one time somebody asked me if you have a uh, cell phones in Africa. <laughs> 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 you know, things like that. I remember when I was on campus, I uh, just got here, and then, uh, you know, I was looking for a gas station to buy a calling card. You know, to uh, to call my mom. I say, hey, mom, how you doing? And then uh, this guy was like, "Hey, you guys have cell phones in Africa?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many? <laughs> did you did you realize anything like that? Or 
Man, he witnessed all those things, man. It's not asking he said, man, y'all, y'all, you know, uh, utensils, spoons, forks, and stuff? I mean, they're, they're shocked that you, <laughs> that you know how to use it in the sport. I mean, it, it, high side is very funny, but, you know, in totality, you look at it as just a limited uh, immersion into the other cultures that people have, which is the, which is basically uh, what it is, is it's just expressing their limited lack of range of use of other cultures. Us coming from Africa, we're always in the dominant. Every African country has multiple ethnicity, multiple cultural backgrounds, and you bring that same uh, dynamic to the states. And then you also have the. I grew up. My best friend had a bad and so guys. So you're talking about sitting them out of the house. You got a whole completely different culture, completely different from yours. I remember walking walk, 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 walk. every day. I'd walk into the mall, and then I'd have to stand and find a way for him because I'm Christian, I'm Muslim. So. But it didn't matter. So you think about now, how often do you see kids here in the states saying, "Yeah, my back, I'm Muslim," and I'm walking to the mosque and in his prayers, and you go back to playing. That's yeah. what happens. You don't hear that now because of the lack. Of Knowledge of culture or whatever you're actually seeing the food for a person. Yeah, I mean that's a very that is uh it's very interesting that you say that because uh you know some of them some of us you know uh in the diaspora we um you know we witness all of those all those things and you know and you see half people today when they, they move to uh to the US or to the diaspora they um you know they they still they are still facing those things you know and uh, some of them you know get shocked but uh, as like we say you know we, we just have to uh, you know to 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 uh, embrace it and hey you know uh, give them more information about where you come from and that's how they will they will learn so Mr Troy you know um, I heard somewhere I don't know if it's true. I heard somewhere that used to play football. I mean, not soccer, uh, football. So, okay, from somebody who is from Nigeria, from Africa, we know that the, the most popular sport in Africa, I mean, of course, around the world too, is soccer. It's football as we call it over there. I mean, did you miss your step by, you know, going saying, okay, I'm going to practice football, and instead of going to the soccer field, you end up at a football field? Like, I'm trying to understand. You say football, football. I mean, this guy, yeah, he plays football. I mean, are you a forward? Are you a goalkeeper? I said, no, he's a, he's a running back. Or I mean, Troy, tell me what happened, man. Did you, did you get, did you get lost somewhere? Tell me. No, no, that, no, I did get lost. No. I actually, I actually in soccer. That was, that, was that was the first one I played was soccer. All positions. And you know, people wanted to be back, back. And what it was was my father was at Oklahoma State University and I think before I he came to the States first and before I came he had you got to do this got his season pass now, you know, I get the season pass now for football games. You know, for football match season coming up. So he gets his whole season pack, goes front row, he's excited, goes down to the city. He's getting ready to watch the match. He's seeing these guys in the dress funny. He's like, okay, maybe there's a little difference. They start going out and pick up the ball and running with it. Mm-hmm. What? This isn't what he knows. He gets upset and he walks out. He just gives his whole season tickets away to somebody and never returns back in the whole season. <laughs> and the funny story is by the time we told so the first day I did, I thought it was soccer, but if you see the way my gravitated to me, and what's funny is the Africans that I speak about that come to the States and they actually get into football that they play in the U.S. You see how it's played. They actually have a, have a grass and an attachment to just as good as any of uh, European league or uh, 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 so that's kind of how I like started off, and then from there, my father just put it in a whole bunch of sports. But I, when I was getting football, that was it. I mean, that was 
immediately in the game. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to play. And, uh, nice, nice. So you got it, you know, you, you fell in love and you got passionate about it and, you know, until you you had this breakthrough to, um, to, 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 to become pro. I mean, how did that happen? Like, okay, I'm, look, I'm looking at this guy who was supposedly to, you know, supposedly out there to, to learn how to play football. And um, uh, ends up loving the American football, and uh, somewhere, somehow, it happens that he becomes pro. I mean, how did you even get the news that you were going to get drafted? Like, you know, people always ask, man, how did, how did that happen, man? Tell me. Well, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, get ready to go to school. Uh, uh, in my school. You know, at uh, so education is not a uh, is not an option. It's a must. It's mandatory. So in that, my parents had like, to find a way to do it. So I mean, my in high school they started giving recruiting letters. College was looking at me. And my parents actually like, oh wow, so this, this thing can't be very well. So I was fortunate to college and my degree, my very fine. So, of course, I, I did everything I could, and I made sure I, I had a model that was uh, less than nothing less. So that's something I learned by from high school to college, and I wouldn't accept anything other than the best. So fortunate enough to catch the eyes of uh, some NFL clubs and being picked up by the St. Louis Rams. So, that's, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know if my facts are right, but you know where I found that you play football. I still, I found out over there that you were the first African born to win the Super Bowl. You know what? Then I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know because when I look at it, I'm like, okay, are you serious? So, Mr. Pershak is the first African born to win the Super Bowl. It could be possible, I don't know. But I, I know there wasn't that many Africans because every teammate that I came across and found out I was African only had like one or two guys they went to college with that they even knew of that were of African descent and maybe even fewer of those that were playing football. The percentage is so low that actually you go from high school, college to the professional level that I have no idea. But, you know, when I was, <laughs> when I was drafted, I, I don't think I kept it. I didn't really keep up with a lot of those stats. The funny thing is, I think my uh, even my place, the, the city I was born in, in Nigeria, was really wrong for a long time, and I didn't even notice it. <laughs> 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 it could be possible. Wow, wow, wow! That's really interesting. So let me let me ask you. Um, that night. When you won the Super Bowl, how did you feel? Was it like um, uh, uh, a sense of accomplishment? Was it like um, you know a sense of making history? Was it like uh, a sense of um, telling your you know looking at your mother and your father and just waiting to hear that son we are proud of you? You know what it was. <laughs> It's a feeling that can survive, and it's a feeling that will probably. Hold on one second. We have a problem somewhere. Um. That yeah. Okay, that's better. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. That's you know technology. We can you can control it, man. You know. Um. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. So I was saying that the sheer uh, magnitude and awesome of it is being able to reach that pinnacle of sports. There is no level higher, and that's what everybody is trying to kind of achieve. Accomplish is the highest in their endeavor, whether it's a musician, whether it's a politician. 
It is a business model. And the funny thing is, the greatest accomplishment for me personally was more so what I had kind of traversed through in high school. In high school, I only won high school games in my entire high school career. So winning was not something that is common to win. But fighting, because every day he was fighting. And a lot of times, even your teachers and everybody, your student body pretty much said, well, you know, you guys are lose another game. We're going to have five my dad's season. You want to go out So to traverse through that, to get to the NFL, that's another part of the job. But then also to get to the playoffs was a big thing. And then you kept winning. And the funny thing is, the Rams before were the uh, their division. They didn't win any of the division. It might have been three or four games on the whole season. So to come to the turnaround and win, not even build up to it, was a big accomplishment. Really became an injury. But when the final seconds tick out the clock and down in the Georgia Dome in Atlanta, and you knew it was really at that point, it was. It wasn't second place. It was the best. Everybody in the world was watching you. I mean, I remember walking around and seeing them, Ryan Carey, Kimby Matumba, and all them. I'm like, they in the stands watching us. And I'm like, this is real. And that's the first time in my life I ever took notice of the stand in my entire life. So to win that championship and to know my family was there somewhere in the game. My family was there, my sisters, my brothers. I mean, it was just, it, it was an immense feeling. They, they, you know, for all of them to be there in one place at that one time, to experience that crown and glory took literally eight, nine years to get to that point. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit interesting how you call, you know, you, know, I, you, you, you mentioned people like Jikembe Mutombo, you know, we are all these um, great African athletes, you know, like they were. Uh, I call them an uh, African ambassador in, in different sports uh, that they, they were involved with, like Dikemi Mutombo, Akim Oladuan, you know, and, um, you know, now we have uh, soccer players like Samuel and You know, those are people that, you know, are, are, you know, whether we we like them or not, we are, we respect the talent, you know. We respect the talent, and then um, they, because they represent a lot. They represent a lot for a younger generation, you know. And then um, it's just inspiring to see where they where they came from and where they are today, you know. And um, now that Troy retired from the the NFL from football, so uh, before uh, going to the the next step of your life, which is I believe business, if I'm correct, right? So. Uh, what is the legacy as a football player? Do you do you carry or you share with others? Is there anything you do? For example, like I said, I mean, I was surprised to 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 hear that Troy was a football player, not a soccer player, but a football player. You know, coming from Africa, is there anything you do or you intend to do? You know. As far as promoting American football in Nigeria or in Africa, for example, you know what? The biggest thing that I do because it's, as far as American football is in Africa as a whole and the continent is, it's, it's so it's so so new. It's so if you notice though, any athletic endeavor, any athletic sport, people gravitate to people they can relate to. So if you don't have a lot of Let's just say not carrying sport. You're not going to see a soccer carrier on that sport as they would be. Kids aren't going to walk, you know, through the fields playing around and saying, "I'm imitating a uh, robot." You know, I'm being this person while I'm playing. They don't do that until somebody they can at least have a relationship. Even if it's saying he went to the same school, he went to my high school, he went to my university, he went. We grew up in the same city, or my parents know from my country, from my tribe. So the main thing that I try to do and try to keep in that and uh, help them because NFL is doing a lot of pride on the African and really changing the game. 
I mean, you got guys, you know, guys that are in 16 years of age, you know, last year, how they are, like in Dominican and uh, the likes of that, uh, Austin Wonga. You got guys who are doing too and just really making an impact. And the main thing I can say that all of us can do in my life, I'm tired and those that are currently playing, is just be visible. You just have to be visible. So being a man in the world, I definitely turn my mind off as often as I can when I'm in town. Because you're so predominantly not in the world. And you see a lot of people. They'll be like, like, like Troy. He's like, 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 like in the NFL. Yeah. And then you see them, you see the boy, like, oh, I don't be like, are you serious? You really did? And then they just, a whirlwind of questions coming out. And what I see in their eyes is, he's a Nigerian. So I, I, can, I can do that. I can go to the NFL. Maybe I can go to the places. So he actually. Was he just, is his parents Nigerian or is he just that he was, you know, saying, I was born in Nigeria. You know, you tell them everything and then they relate to that and then they're like, here goes my mother. And then they see your mother and they're So I said, the main thing that we do is be visible. That's in your legacy, be visible and actually open this to be embrace it. I'm Nigerian. I make sure that you know, yeah, I'm Nigerian. I'm born in Nigeria. I was raised in between Nigeria and the U.S. And I say, okay, no, that actually it doesn't differentiate me from those that are here in my family and from other places. That actually gives my young boys and girls and people that are kind of the same. And it is, it is. Okay. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. So, uh, we taking the NFL to Africa, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> let's 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 work on it. Let's work on it and see how we can make it happen. You know, you know let's work on it. And uh, I know uh, my brother, Mr. Franco, who is uh, will be part of uh, of it, and we actually be happy to uh, you know to, to 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 promote NFL in uh, in Africa. So we're gonna get to that when Franco uh, will get on uh, get the mic. So. Troy, we um we just went you know uh, through your personal life from uh, uh, Nigeria to the U.S. You know the the NFL career. Now you are uh, you retire from the NFL and you're a businessman. You um uh, you own a company. Uh, you own a foundation too, as as uh, as I'm aware of. And um, uh, what is it that you do? And then uh, how was the transition from being a pro ball player, private jet, fancy cars, tons of money, you know, to um, uh, 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 to a normal business person? Because you know, I mean, it's not a lie. We all know, you know. Contract millions of dollars, Maserati or whatsoever, no poop, but you know, great cars, trips on private jets and first class, fancy hotels. Now that you retire from that world, was the transition hard? You know, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm thinking from, from two standpoints. Standpoint. Okay. The, the transition <laughs> for me. For me. <laughs> Wasn't as hard in the aspect that most people see, and, they, uh, see. and the reason why I say that is, I have parents that do it very grounded. Um, culture was huge. Everything that we were playing as kids, you know, we told us we're in the but we're not in of this place. Meaning that outside, you know, we, you work, you work, operate, and do as Americans do, and you. Operate between the inside. We are still culturally sound. I was Nigerian for years, and everything that I know um, instills in us. So I say that at the time, a lot of things that my parents were speaking to, it never was anything that you know you get too engulfed into. So transition out is I, I never had a car over twenty four hours. Only drive one time. So I only had one car at a time. <laughs> so, transitioning is uh, difficult in that standpoint. And then, 
you made a mention about transitioning <laughs> business. Um, I won't say I ever transitioned in the business because I just took out the business to play football, and I just returned back to business. Because my parents, we family, we'd always been in business. My father, a PhD graduate, but never worked in his, uh, with his position until maybe 2003, 2002. Because what he was doing was he was in his video and he, I mean, he stood. And so, of course, us growing up, we always grew up in that household. And it's funny because we going back to uh, Nigeria quite often. I've never met a vegetarian that just did one thing, let alone I've met an African that just did one thing. And they always had a family, even if they were a student, even if they were a doctor, even if they were a politician, a lawyer, even a pastor. All of them had a business. So you say transition into business. I don't think it was so much of a transition. I think it was so is redirecting most of your available time to be able to go into business. And that's what got me up to what I do now, which is a project that's so so on international business and international relations. Okay, okay. So you, um, I'm actually, um, <laughs> I don't want to say I'm assuming. I'm not going to say I'm sure, but I kind of had a sense of you saving all that money somewhere in Nigeria. So we shall come to go to Nigeria and enjoy the the NFL money because it looks like you know, I mean, you save all that those millions of dollars, man. So I should. Um, I should get my uh, my, <laughs> my assistant. Like I have to get my ticket to Nigeria. You know. Let me, let me say that too. I did enjoy my life when I was playing ball immensely. No, you did. Great time. I had an old World War II veteran that said, "My heart just went to me. It's taking me all over the world and so many things that I never would have been able to see had it not been for God." I can tell you, I'm a huge testament to football. Great thing. That's good. That's good. I mean, it's a prudence, prudence in your finances and thinking for the future instead of for the now is probably what helped me out. Yeah, I think um, is a. Uh, I don't want to say I can relate to that because I don't have millions like you, but um, I think um, uh, uh, is is the key, and um, it's unfortunate that a lot of people don't. Don't realize it when they, you know, they still are active. And then I was watching a documentary about um, uh, Matty Johnston, I and mean, uh, he, uh, he started investing his money. You know, the guy bought ten percent of the Lakers. You know, when he was still playing. I mean, it's just amazing how people have that. Uh, you know, they are driven by business, and you know. So after all, when all that fame and you know contracts. And the football life is over, you know. It's easy, or the sport life is over. It's easy to adjust, you know. So I hope uh, people get, especially the young, you know, the, the, those young athletes getting drafted or signing new contracts. I hope they could learn from you. And then, uh, you that's, know, that's, you know, there's been a lot of my discussions, topics with uh, young guys, guys. I get a lot of friends now who. Are constantly asking, hey, I've got a friend, you've got a son, or you've got a nephew that's currently playing these protein got one that's playing one playing with Could you talk to them? And you know, the, I'm the type of person I've had many people that's a great mentor in my life. I always realize before you can request a mentor, you have to be ready and willing to accept. What I call it. It was nothing. It was a quarterback an old, old quarterback. And he was just trying to do what his what his was doing. And the young quarterback didn't want to listen to him. I mean he just he just said he said, he said learn. Eventually eventually he needs to go to pick up. So you better get him get off the gold nuggets while he can because it's not gonna always be there and be available. And it's funny because it, 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 it happened that way. And what I, I say that in relation to say, in speaking with some of these young guys, I'm thinking about, thinking about, 
the easiest thing to be in the NFL when I went to the NFL. It was, you had to really look to spend money. It was easy to spend money when you had people around you to take the money. But when you just spend the money, you have to be doing pretty much something. A lot of records. Not saying everything is records because there's other things that you do. But if you think about it, I don't recall the things I was going to when we were saying here is that the minute you walk through the room, Oh, we got you guys in here. We got you guys in here. We got this. We got that. You've been fun. And then you uh, you come this for meetings or film or working out six days out of the week, five days out of the week, one day, you got one day off. That one day off, you're watching one day and you're rehabbing it. Getting ready for the next week. You only have to I don't think I only have about four weeks of off season time in a year. I was I came back and saw my mother two weeks, uh, maybe two weeks out of the year. So you know you can't get all that. You don't really have a whole lot of time to do it. That's why it's very important on who you have around you, and who's dropping what. Another thing, the goal is. Um, that was a. Uh... You know, that's, those are very you know, interesting points that you, you bring up. And then, um, like I said, you know, the, I hope the younger generation and those, you know, those new athletes and can look up to you and reach out to you as well to, you know, to, to seek for advice and uh, to get advices from you because, you know, we, we need people to, uh, to focus on, on what they do and, you know, not only the, the fame. And um, Mr. Troy is, um, you know, I don't have the the the, the monopoly of questions, and then I have uh, a lot of people out there that are actually eager to, you know, to to, to ask you, you know, uh, some questions. So we're gonna start, and um, uh, the you know, it's simple. They're just gonna ask you the you know questions and. You know, you choose to answer or not if you, if you like. But, uh, you know, uh, actually, you know, like I told you when I reached out to you about the interview, I said, uh, um, uh, let it be free, let it be uh, uh, very diplomatic, and but at the same time, it's an open book, you know. So, you, 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 I know somebody asked me the other day, um, is he married? So, <laughs> And I told the person to come and ask the question, you know, when they um, they, they they get online. So I will, I hope the person will be there and then uh, ask the question because you know as I want to remind our viewers that you have the Q A uh, box, you know, on the beside the, the your camera, and you can ask uh, you can type in your questions if you you have any question for Troy or for any of the the participant. So go ahead and send your, your questions. You have a QA box right there. You know, type in and then uh, Troy will uh, answer those questions as we we, we continue. So I'm gonna ask the I'm gonna ask the first person uh, who is representing a magazine uh, based out of Atlanta. Her name is Lemma, and um, you know you probably are aware of uh, my partners. You know, magazine um, uh, for the show. My partners for the show, and uh, among them, the magazine Dunya Magazine, which is a multicultural magazine, is uh, the purpose of the magazine is bridging the gap between cultures. So, so she's invited to the show today uh, because, as we say, bridging the gap, you know, bring, means bringing people together, you know, for a better future. So I will I will open the floor for uh, uh, Miss Lema. Miss Lema, toy is all yours. Yes, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Um, it is really an honor to, to speak with you face to face, as face to face as we can get, you know, through the camera. So, um, <laughs> and your story is just incredible. We are proud as Africans um, to have such powerhouses like you um, come from the continent. So I'll just go ahead and and ask. Um, my question, and my question is um, probably you have traveled and you have um, worked with 
people from different cultures. Um, I would like to know what are some of the key qualities that you possessed and, and that you developed over time to get you to achieve the kind of su success and the quality of life that you have achieved over the years. What were some of the key qualities that you had to develop in case anybody is listening who is also trying to be successful and trying to build a business or to follow their dreams? What, what are some of those qualities that they need to, to develop? You know, it, in one word, knowledge. It's that simple. You know, it's one of my constant desires, constant drives, and constant prayers is I don't want wealth, I don't want fame, I don't want money, I don't want any of that, but give me knowledge, wisdom. I, and I pray, I say, give me more knowledge than King Solomon, who kings and queens from all over the world came in droves to come see one man. Not for his money, because he had more than enough. And most of that probably came by ways of gifts. But they came for his wisdom and his knowledge. Mm -hmm. And in that, there's power. Where you have knowledge, where you have wisdom, there's power. Now, what you do with that knowledge and you do with that power is what differentiate the levels of height of things that people uh, achieve. So with that, reading. I was in Spain with a bunch of guys. I lived in Spain two years, and I lived in uh, Sitges outside of Barcelona. And the funny thing is, the older people there only spoke Spanish, and I, I was bad at Spanish in high school, but everyone else wanted me to translate for them. But how I did it was, whenever they took siestas, I wasn't used to siestas, so I would just walk around the cobblestone streets. I'm looking at this magnificent country that's very different and I have this opportunity to be here, and they're actually paying me to be here. And the people, I would just go in the shops and just talk. And I would, I would say, I would just, I had all I needed to learn was how do you say in Spanish? That's it. So I can relate to them on their level, on their language level. But from there, they poured in me an immense amount of knowledge. With that knowledge, gave me power because now I can expand. I knew the rail systems and the train systems like the back of my hand. I could be anywhere and just know which way I needed. But that knowledge came from how to communicate. What do people like? One thing the older ones did not like is, how can you come to our country and force us to speak your language when you're in our country? That's knowledge. Because a lot of the Americans, it wasn't, so, it wasn't something they were doing intentionally. They just didn't have the knowledge and know-how of that was offensive to the older people when you keep speaking English and say, I don't understand you. Do you speak English? Do you speak English? That's offensive to them yeah. because you're in my country. And if you think about it, you take that anywhere in the world. If you learn the greetings, the common communication, the do's and the don't, how far can you get within a culture, within a people? It doesn't matter what country, what your skin color is. You can go a lot further than where you can with that knowledge. That's true. That is true. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That is very, very true. Okay. Mr. Tattoo, the floor is yours. Okay, Mr. Lema, thank you so much for uh, that question. It was very interesting as well. Uh, so I will give the next... Um, uh, I will, I guess I will go with the lady first <laughs> because uh, Mr. Franco, you know, as we do, uh, ladies first. So, um, Mr. Troy, the next question comes from uh, Latin, and Latin is a media, I mean, TV and radio personality based in Chicago, Illinois, and um, she has a, what they call a Latin B show, and then uh, she. Um, has done a lot of events in Chicago, in the Chicago area, and I mean, like, recently she was actually on Steve Harvey's show to talk about some uh, some uh, women issues. So I don't want to get into that. Those are just women issues. So she will, you know, if you have a question for her, she will answer you, <laughs> answer it. So uh, Latin, the the floor is all yours. Okay, thank thank you, Pierre. Anyways, Troy. Yes. I don't know if you guys you can hear me, but um, 
um, congratulations on everything, your foundation, your business, and just your career in the NFL, of course. But I just wanted to know real quickly, um, when are you doing something in Chicago? Any speaking events coming up in Chicago? Oh man, I, I got I've had people that that are trying to they've been trying to pull me to Chicago for the last year. And I there is a possibility I will I will be making it up to Chicago. Um Chicago is has an immense amount of rich culture, rich African culture. I've been through Chicago quite a bit, played in Chicago. So I'm really looking to go when it gets a lot warmer. <laughs> but I am looking to come to Chicago. Um I know around April time there's a lot of uh international talks and really uh, talks on the African continent as a whole, you know, I've done a lot of speaking engagements as far as engaging and um, really introducing and making, giving people knowledge about the, con the continent of Africa as a whole, Sub-Saharan to be exact, and the um, power that it has financially, uh, you know, seven of the largest, fastest growing economies are found in one continent. And I'm just giving people just the sheer numbers and sheer size of the potential, and, and now with this new things coming out where they're talking about the mint economies, you know, it's a big opportunity and a big talk. I know um, Quentin Primo is doing a lot of things in the Chicago area and does a lot of speaking engagements. And then also there's a few uh, other big uh, big powerhouses, companies and consulting companies, some of the bigger firms that are they can, which can able to scale into Africa a lot easier. So I'm looking forward to lining up some things to be, if not speaking, or at least being in attendance on some key discussions and key tops, talks in Chicago. In April, May, May time frame. Thank you. Okay, my last question. Peter told me to ask this: Are you single? <laughs> <laughs> I I, I want to know. <laughs> hey, hey. To my to mother, mother, to my mother's disappointment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to okay, okay. <laughs> that's all. That's, that's the issue. Yeah, single in the sense that you know, Africans, Africans don't see anything other than either you're married or you're not. not. <laughs> so, <laughs> her, she's like, I don't know what's wrong with this. My last one, this is my first one. I don't understand what's going on. You want to give it off? <laughs> uh, that's uh, that was uh, that was I. I want to call it a chair. I never asked her to ask that question. She uh, she asked me if you were single. So and and then she said uh, somebody, a friend of hers, asked the question. So the the friend of I guess the friend of hers is among the the, the viewer that we uh, that are watching us. So she had to, to oh, ask the question for. Look, don't you have on your side? That, don't you see people that are against? Limelight. It is a, a, a marketing taboo to be engaged, marriage, or in a relationship. I think that was one of your conversation topics you had on there. Actually, you're absolutely. Okay, I did mention that. Yes, I do think it depends on the type of media, you know, person that you are. But people do kind of have a thing against men that are engaged or married, you know, publicly. So you can be that, but just keep it private to me. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, just keep it private, private, private. And uh, but I mean, I just I was just asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm a strong proponent of keeping that private personally. So. Definitely, I'm a very good so yes, I do understand. That. Okay. All right. I'm going to connect. Actually, the actually, party show party. is on its way here. They're going to be taking something at my lounge. So that's a plug right there for Fleetwood, Chicago. And uh, you guys have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. So, um, yeah, you know, we had Latin. Uh, thank you, Latin, for your participation. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we appreciate you. Uh, good luck with uh, the Steve Avi uh, at your lounge. Um, so our next... Uh, uh, you know the next guest um, uh, who's going to ask the question is uh, Mr. Franco. Franco is a uh, CEO of uh, Franco Records, is a label um, based in um, in Houston, Texas. So, Mr. Franco, Mr. Troy is all yours. Hi, Mr. Troy. How you doing? Good afternoon. 
it's a great pleasure and a wonderful opportunity to uh, video conference with you. I, I, I think I am, I am much honored by your level of success yet with your level of humility. Uh, I think you are one of those pillars who have paved the way for you know the young Africans in the diaspora who can not only think but who can actually ma uh, match that thinking with action. So it's a wonderful pleasure to be an honor to know you because I can say I know you from now. <laughs> Good, thank you. So my, my question is um, like Pierre introduced me, I'm the owner of Frank Records. Besides that, um, I'm the um, uh, I own Novelty Tax and Accounting. I'm an accountant by profession. So, and business to me has always been one of those things that I'm very passionate about. So, I was when Pierre told me he was I was going to be on on, on a panelist. I, when I was reading some, I was trying to read more to know more about you. And one of the things that struck me about about you is one of the quotes that I read here on um, I read this quote on Afri Bees. They said making making business happen in Africa. It said Troy Peshak, NFL player talks to Charlotte Africa Business Week. And there was there's a statement here that really struck me. I would like you to maybe share more light on this. You said, and I quote, Africa has anything anyone can imagine for business opportunities. Can you say more about that? Yes, um, and it's it's true. It's funny. Africa has anything and everything. I've been fortunate enough to be raised, be birthed and raised by parents who reach the highest level of education. There is PhD and uh, multi degree, so education was always a key. But then also work in business, and in doing so, I've also been able to work in Africa, Europe. And the U.S. and in doing and in being able to take all those into account and putting them on an even plane, I've noticed the potential, even since the uh, early 2000s, of what Africa as a whole. And then just being able to cross liaison with other Africans. I mean, if you just just going by, irrespective of what I saw, people might take it as being biased, being from Africa, and then actually being there and seeing it myself. But just taking the sheer numbers and the, the economists called Africa the Dark Continent and then had to retract that statement on uh, later on. When have you ever heard of any newspaper or any uh, medium that has retracted a statement? But they came and had to because, and I think, Phil, is the sheer growth and the magnitude of it. And I say that to say that everything that I've seen, that I see growing and what's happening in Africa, you have, you, 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 you see it if you can look from a strong vantage point, you see it most of the U.S. and European countries 20, 30 years in the making. So before they got to where they're at, you see that, okay, this is the same thing that's kind of transitioning, it's just happening the African way. And then you take share, if you just take purely numbers, um, as of 2012, 2013, seven of the top ten fastest growing economies were all found in Africa. A GDP of over 1.6 trillion U.S. dollars, and they're talking about with uh, the BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and then they included South Africa in there, which now I put African continent on a map, and African South Africa being the largest economy, but now they're talking about when they re-baseline the numbers that Nigeria will surpass South Africa in GDP. Now, all that is going to say at the same point is which way are you looking at your data and information because people will say, well, there's no the downside to Africa is you can't get a pulse on it, you can't really do businesses. Well then how are the people there doing business? And then also you take a point you take a look at is well, it's hard to get data, hard to get anything out of there. And I say, well that's the that's where you see the opportunity. Because if you're saying that these are the hard data that they're able to come and present out on a national medium, we we're talking about IMF, World uh, World Trade and all these other numbers that are coming out and they're saying that all these numbers are coming out but you're saying the data isn't even strong what happens when you get a stronger data on top of that you I, I just this past trip I just came back from Nigeria uh, about 
two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. I was there for about three months. Just this past trip, I met about four or five young Nigerians who relocated back to Nigeria. And we're talking about guys who had been in the U.S. 10 plus years. One opened up a, a lounge. He left New York to come and open up a lounge in Abuja. Two took positions within different companies and different pair of saddles. And then the others were just coming back and setting up businesses. And they were like, man, it's so much to get into and so much to do that you can get lost in the opportunity because it's so open and so wide. So that's what I'm even looking at is every one of these numbers that you're coming is just now that you're hearing about Africans exporting to the U.S. and to other uh, coffee now being uh, exported out of Ethiopia but, uh, in conjunction with the Abyssinian Church. And then South African wines. You know, it's, a, it's one lady that got the entire distribution, I think, for Walmart for South African wines. So now she's exporting South African wines. And people don't know a lot of Mercedes that you drive in the U.S. are manufactured in South Africa. So you start rolling in all those numbers. There's nothing that I have not seen in opulence and in business and in just entertainment, enjoyment in Africa, in the U.S. that I have not seen in Africa. I would say that I have not even seen just in Nigeria alone. Whether you're talking about transportation, vehicles, uh, entertainment, movie theaters, game reserves, oil exploration, uh, video, uh, they got these uh, video chairs now. So all these little small little things, ice cream shops, fast food restaurants, fast food chains, weddings, hall, wedding halls. I mean, the, everything you can think of that I was doing, I literally was not missing a beat being in uh, Africa as opposed to being in the U.S. And it's still steadily growing. That was very impressive, and I, I just uh, want to thank you for that insight. Because you see, most of the time, the Africans here in the dias in the diaspora, especially here in the U.S., is lack of information that is actually. Because you see, while we're back here, there's a great disconnect with the continent. So most of what we know here are the things that because remember, the 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 the, the Western media sometimes. I mean, not of their fault. Sometimes they don't; they do not have the data to feed us here. So I'm um, just with people like you, you know, going back and talking to business forums. I I, I, just, I just wish when I when I when I, I could be able to book you to come talk down here in Houston, Texas. Uh, that would be that would be that would be my greatest. <laughs> Mr. Tattoo, you have to make that work for me, okay? <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's all my pleasure to have, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's 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 a great pleasure, Mr. Troy, and I will I'll keep following you up, and I I keep I start reading about you, and it's interesting. I'll keep reading. Thank you. Definitely. You know, there's there's a lot of opportunities that you have just to meet African people and leg up on everyone here. That's the thing that we spoke about. African and it's present to Africans that are in Africa is I tell the ones in Africa, stop taking your eyes off Africa looking to get abroad. I don't care what it is, anything other than knowledge and education, and that's for a short term. Stop taking your eyes off Africa. You have no idea the potential gold mine, literally, that you're sitting on in almost every sector right under your feet, but you're steadily looking how can I get out or get somewhere else? And you're going to leave the gold mine for who? You're going to leave the gold mine for, the, for everyone else to come back in. And then I tell the ones in diaspora is start reconnecting back with your, you say, well, I don't know what business, I don't know what to do. Just start reconnecting back with your own village, your own city, and just start conversations. Conversations is what opens the door to a lot of things. Like I gave you the example when I was in Spain. That's how I opened my eyes to a lot of things. I mean, I, 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 have, I still get a lot of things from Spain just because I know I can get it to that quality from there, but it starts from conversation. Conversation opens the doors that you begin to connect back with yours, friends, families, those in diaspora. You get on your uh, Facebook pages and you join certain groups that are from people that you know or your university. 
your uh, tribal uh, ethnic background, your religion. You just start getting connected back. You start discussing before you start talking. That's all the insights you need. So that data that the World Bank can't give you, that CNN can't give you, that IMF can't give you, that's where you get it from. They give they, It's those you connect with, and they'll give you that real-time data. That is more valuable than the millions that they can spend into uh, data mining that a big corporation will have to do to get into to scale to a country. So you can't wait till that point. You have to get up on your feet and utilize the tools you have, and you have to realize you have tools that others just don't have. Wow. Thank you. So, Mr. Franco, uh, you know, it was my pleasure to um, to make it happen, Mr. Troy. You know, I know Mr. Troy is. Um, I mean, you said something earlier before, you know, asking me your question. You know, uh, it's impressive to see somebody who accomplished so much, like Mr. Troy Pelshak, and then uh, that person keeps that humility. The guy is humble. So, you know, I won't mind, you know, uh, uh, having somebody like that as, as a friend. And uh, Mr. Sorry, if your friend is still open, I would like to be your friend, you know. Um, <laughs> still open. <laughs> so, yes, um, we're going to wrap up soon. And uh, sorry, we started the, the show um, uh, three minutes late and, uh, you know, it happens due to technology, and um, before we uh, we we put the end to the show, I'm gonna ask um, Miss Lema to uh, you know to tell us uh, you know uh, what she, she thinks about um, the show, and you know if she has any other question for Mr. Troy, Mr. Lema, the floor is all yours. Thank you, sir. Um, Troy. I just want to say that nothing compensates for wisdom, like you said, and sometimes, I, and I believe that wisdom comes with experience. And they say that with life, you learn and you experience it, and then you learn you learn the lesson after. So it is really great to tap into your wealth of knowledge and experience. But one question I would like to, and I also like to note that what you said about Africa is very you know, very, very important, and I would like to encourage everybody to remember that, like you said, Africa is an emerging economy, which means that there's lots of opportunities for us to go and actually build on what is emerging. But I would like to ask you, um, for somebody that experienced, uh, that made so much money, um, and for some of, some of us that, you know, are still to make a million dollars, but so what are some of the like as far as when you have such cash flow what what are some really important financial decisions how do you how do how how do how do we handle you know finances what are some some decisions that you made that were key because i've realized that there are ups and downs when you're in business there is times when your cash flow is really high there are times when you don't really know what tomorrow brings so, what would you what what financial um, less lessons have you learned that are really really important? I'm personally very curious about that. How do you invest your money? What do you do with your cash flow? Um, what's important to note? <laughs> let me let me give you a little insight. Um, none none of my cash flow, I guess, from my playing days went into business, per se, in Africa. So none of it, none of my NFL helped or any of that helped in my cash flow. All it probably, the most it did was it allowed me to be able to go home and take my parents and my family with me, take my, send the whole family there. That was the most, and then also look at other things. But you got to understand, the only things I got into were the things that we were already doing as a family, even before when I was young. So the things that we knew, just having cash flow is if, if your mindset is only on the abundance or the lack thereof of cash, you will never really reach your potential. Meaning that you have to look at the goal and the desire, what it is you want to attain, and then you have to educate and make, give, make yourself knowledgeable about it, and then you have to learn from it. 
So even before, even without cash flow, the first thing I do, I take it from a very elementary state. If I have something I want to get into, I start researching. I research the heck out of it. Then the first, then after that, I look for somewhere I can gain more knowledge that are practical. That means someone who's doing it. I intern. I, I still intern to this day. And it's funny is since I left university, I had I had oh every off season I've always been in school. And I thought I would never, I'm the one that hated school. When I walked across stage and got my diploma, the first thing I did was I gave it to my mother and said, now I'm done. I've accomplished what you want to accomplish. Now I can go do what I want to do. And that's the last time that I've seen my degree. So I, I don't know where it's at. I haven't looked at it because I, but the funny thing is the very next off season, I went to Africa. The next one after that, every off season after that, I was taking a course at a community college or the university or something. I was always doing something. Meaning that I needed to educate myself on what it is I wanted to do and then go find. There are people out there ready and willing to teach you. That is more than any amount. And then you leverage your relationships. A lot of what I've been doing in Africa and what I'm doing is just based off purely leveraging relationships. I can tell you now the most, I guess, I've profited in the region has become from relationships that was just started in 2006. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about something that just pretty much is still very young and I and fairly new and it didn't require a lot of money, but it's leveraging that. So you can't really focus on the money. You have to be able to leverage what it is and be prudent about it and just say you can't just throw a lot of money in what feels like a good idea, a hobby. Like, you know, I watch a lot of Shark Tank and it's like they're not going to invest your money on your hobby. They're not going to invest the money on their your vision or your dream. They're going to your passion is what they invest in, the person, and what have you done to get to that point? How far have you taken it? What can you do? They don't, not in the startup. So meaning that if I don't have that availability, let me show myself worth more than just a common startup. Let me show myself knowledgeable. Let me show myself working within that field or at least doing it. Because if you have the passion and drive to do it, you will find the time to do it. Learn. Educate. Practice, try it out before you pour, throw real money into it. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That puts it all into perspective. If you have a passion for it. Okay. Thank you so much, Troy. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Miss Lema. And, um, you know, I will give a uh, mic to uh, Mr. Franco for a quick, um, you know, to share a uh, brief. Really Briefly, you know, he starts. Mr. Franco, the mic is all yours. Yes, it's, it, it, it's, it's really, really a, a pleasure. I want to congratulate you, Mr. Tattoo, for the show. I know this is the first show, Mr. Tattoo, is that correct? Yes, it's the first show. Pretty impressive. And I, I think your guest, your first guest, speaks volume about the vision of the show. So, you know, you should keep up. I mean, the, the likes of Troy. I, I after the show, uh, it, it's not just the NFL rings that he won that has impressed me after the show. What has impressed me is a progressive and consistent mind bent on making a difference in Africa. That was very impressive. So thank you, Mr. Troy. Thank you, Mr. Tattoo. Thank you, Lemmer, and I thank the panel. So, Mr. Troy, um, now the the floor is all yours. Before I conclude, what would you say? Uh, first and foremost, I would say I'd like to thank you for having me on the show, and it's been a pleasure to be able to speak to the audience. And thank, and thank you for the question. Meanwhile, very intriguing to watch, uh, watch what you do, how you present yourself, but stop the question is very intriguing, very, very, very impressive. Um, go, your passion, your vision behind it, uh, it, it, it encourages me every time. Every any time you feel like you know, is you're, you're fighting off this battle, and you hear others who have the same passion behind it, and you need to display differently. Really good strength and value is important. I encourage you all to continue to follow your passions, follow your desires, 
and you do with painstaking attention to detail. And that's something that you learn from uh, my special teams coach, my uh, rookie, rookie and second year, that it was just it's the painstaking detail. Uh, if I didn't have to do a balance, I would have to do a balance in one direction or way off in another direction. So my I just encourage you and every one of you to continue to impact other people. Uh, I leave you with my one of my mentors, life mentor. Anything that I have value to be of value to someone else. It is not a value to see It is not a value to see Thank you, Mr. Troy. And then, um, you know, it's, uh, it's actually my pleasure to, you know, to, to have hosted you today. And, um, you know, I, um, I hope you will be, you know, among the panelists in our next, uh, you know, next uh, events and interviews. Uh, I just want to, you know, uh, thank everybody for being here today. Uh, Lema, Franco, Latin. We had Jean Francois um, uh, who disappeared after that. I don't know, maybe uh, some uh, network issue. Um, we had um, uh, 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 all these interesting questions, interesting topic that we, you know, we debated on and. It was it was quite inspiring to have uh, this conversation, you know. So I want everybody to, you know, to clap for themselves. <laughs> uh, it was very uh, it was very uh, very great, and you know, I just want to take this uh, this opportunity to to thank all our um, our, our our sponsors. Uh, from uh, uh, DJ Fly, from Fly Vision, who actually uh, did our flyer uh, and help us with uh, a lot of technical things. Um, Dunia Magazine, of course, uh, Franco Records, uh, Akonovi, uh, Latin B Show, and Ticket Production. You know, um, it's all together that we made this happen. It's not because uh, they have a great, a great host, but because everybody tipped in and uh, we all work together to make this happen. So we want to thank you all for watching this show today. Uh, the next show is Sunday, the the 26th, I believe. Yes, Sunday the 26th at 2:30, and uh, the host is uh, Dr. Victor Latourie, the man behind uh, NAFCA. NAFCA is a uh, Nollywood and African. Critic, film critics in the USA, so they have a, it's basically the African Film Award. So Mr. Do, Mr. Latoye is our next guest, and uh, tune in, share the the event, invite people to like the page. You know, you can um, you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, and uh, Google Plus or YouTube. So we are on Toto Tattoo on Facebook, Toto Tattoo on Twitter. Google Plus and uh, YouTube, and um, till then, may God bless you, and see you on the 26th. Thank you all. <laughs>